Georgetown, we have a public lecture series where we bring in uh, some big names in education policy. And we are very pleased today uh, to have uh, Robert Pianda, who is the Dean of the Curry School of Education at the University of Virginia, um, and also is the Director of the National Center for Research in Early Childhood Education and the Center for Advanced Study of Teaching and Learning. Um, Dr. Pianta got to start as a special education teacher many years ago. Um, and most of his uh, research, at least recent research, is focused on uh, understanding early childhood education, um, and in particular recently understanding kind of classroom um, teacher-student interactions within classrooms and understanding how these can be uh, predictive of student learning gain. And then some recent work, how we can actually, through policy interventions, um, the professional development intervention, uh, change some of these student and teacher interactions. He's branched out from the early childhood uh, arena and now is doing some work in uh, elementary and secondary schools. And uh, today he's going to talk about uh, a collection of his work. Um, and we're very pleased to have him here. So the format, for those of you that don't know, we'll, he'll speak for about 50 minutes or an hour or so, and then we'll have about maybe 20 minutes left for questions at the end. And then we have a, a little reception out in the Great Hall uh, we can, where we can continue the conversation afterwards. So it's my great pleasure. We welcome uh, Bob Keanu. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. OK, am I wired? Are we ready? Um, thank you very much. It's great to be here and, and uh, be able to talk to you about the work that we've been doing for the last uh, several years. What I'd like to um, offer is the possibility that you will think of this work not only on um, its own merits in relation to the problems that we're trying to tackle in uh, preparing um, a better, in a sense, workforce of teachers of young kids, because most of it's going to be embedded around young kids, but is illustrative, I think, of what um, what I think can happen when um, we set in for a long period of time to tackle complicated problems in education, like what teachers do with kids in classrooms and does that matter, and, and chew on that for a fairly long period of time, longer than I wish uh, in some days, and, and uh, the fact that some results can come from that over, over the long haul. So I think that's, that's a message to graduate students, um, that it's worth it to hang around with, uh, with these tough problems as you get going on them. So um, some of the, the problems that we have tried to address through this work, um, uh, first a very descriptive problem that is um, what actually are the experiences that are offered to kids in classrooms? What are the, the opportunities to learn at a level of a fairly large scale? So I'm going to talk about a, a, a very large number of classrooms that we observed across the country. And in a sense, this is a question about the epidemiology of, of, of uh, experiences and learning opportunities in classrooms. Um, the question, obviously, of whether what, um, we're taking the stance that interactions matter, we need to test that stance in relation to, to child outcomes and whether those, um, the measures that we develop work in the ways that we would hope. And then can those um, assessments and those observations be leveraged for improvement of teaching and the effectiveness of teachers? Um, and in a sense to be involved in the measurement, evaluation, and improvement of teacher quality at some level of scale through standardized observation. So the context for that last uh, point really being, uh, in, in some sense, as we begin to watch the reauthorization of No Child Left Behind take place, um, what will be the metrics for accountability on the input end as well as on the output end? So um, we will continue to obviously, I think, um, uh, assess children's outcomes. Um, how will we define um, teacher quality and assess that um, as a set of inputs to educational processes? Um, so I'm going to talk about um, results from two large-scale observational studies. Um, these, you know, we, we did these observations uh, in classrooms some, in, at some level by accident because we were involved in these studies uh, and they ended up um, doing observations in classrooms. So the first one is um, the National Center for Early Development and Learning's multi-state pre-K study. Let me describe this just quickly. Um, we, this was part of the initial, um, about 10 years ago, uh, IES Early Childhood Research Center. The question of interest at that point was, as state-funded pre-K programs begin to scale out for kids, 
um, what's the quality of what's being offered in those classrooms, and, and is there some association uh, that can be gauged between the quality of what's being offered to kids and kids' outcomes? So are those, are the, is there some connection there? The uh, NICH, that, state, that study involved 11 different states with uh, programs uh, selected randomly and then uh, classrooms within programs selected randomly for observation. The NISHD study of early child care, a lot of you probably know about this, um, and youth development, um, is um, a, a longitudinal study of about 1,300 kids initiated at birth. Uh, those kids, uh, if you know the study, were observed at home and were observed in child care uh, as they aged through those settings. When the children went to school, we continued observations in the classrooms that they went to, and in a sense, this is a very typical sample of kids born in 1991 in the country, and what we're seeing is what they ended up aging into as they entered school, and observations in their first, third, and fifth grade classrooms are included in that. If you add up all those observations, you end up with uh, roughly 4,000 classrooms in, uh, all across the country that were observed using fairly similar um, sets of standardized procedures, and I'll talk about those in a moment, more than about 4,000 classrooms. It is the largest set that we can gauge of systematic um, and standardized observations in, um, in early education settings in the United States. A very important part of this is all the teachers that we went in to observe were credentialed or certified by the state to teach what it was that they were teaching when we showed up and that uh, those, um, all those observations were done with the permission of the teacher and were, um, were scheduled on a day that the teacher indicated would be one of the more academic days so we didn't go in and, and observe during a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of assemblies. Okay, we, as I said, we, we used two approaches to observing in classrooms, uh, both of which were standardized. Everybody met um, uh, rigorous criteria for reliability. We did drift tests as, as uh, people went out into the field, and all of these um, were conducted uh, starting at the start of the school day and then running through a period of cycles throughout the day. Uh, sometimes the observations were half day, sometimes they were, they were whole day. Um, w at one level, we went in and simply counted, uh, in a, counted or, or actually time sampled, um, uh, opportunities to learn that children's were, the children were exposed to in these different grades. So we would have roughly uh, 44 different kinds of uh, indicators of opportunity and behavior on, um, on the scales, and then every 30 seconds the observer was marking whether, uh, which one of those opportunities, uh, the, uh, however many of those opportunities the child was exposed to. So this, this would be composed of things like what is the setting that the instruction is occurring in? Is it group setting? Is it individual seat work? Is it small group? It would also capture the content of what was being delivered in the instruction, literacy and language arts, math and science, uh, history, social studies, um, or, or the like. Uh, and then we observed whether the, te the, the child was engaged. So this, this takes a very kind of um, discrete behavior approach to understanding opportunities to learn in classrooms. Um, just again, descriptively, a lot of these, these results are published in a paper that we, um, we published in Science in 2007. Um, the vast majority of what we saw in, in terms of teachers' interactions with kids um, and instruction that was offered to kids uh, occurred in context of whole group activities like, like this or individual seat work. 85% of children's instructional time is spent in either of those two contexts. So I think one of the things that we saw was uh, the very, very low um, incidents or, or, or opportunities um, that occurred in the context of small group activities. We have this kind of myth that a lot of instruction in elementary school occurs in small group. Uh, about 3% of the time uh, kids were, um, were offered um, that kind of instruction. Um, we see very few interactions. Again, remember these are early childhood and early elementary classrooms. So lots of times we try to think of these as places where the teacher's engaged in lots of, um, of interactions with kids and is moving around the room. Um, on average, during a, during a typical hour, the typical child is exposed to about four interactions with a teacher. There's four occasions during which um, an interaction might occur um, between a teacher and an individual child. Almost all of what we see um, this changes a little bit across the grades, but almost all of what we see is literacy. 
in um, pre-K, in those state-funded pre-K programs, or at 54 months where we're in just child care observations for the NICHD study, we saw um, if instruction occurred, it occurred in, broadly speaking, literacy or language arts. Um, as you move into first grade, um, observing in a first grade setting in a, a, in a typical day all day long, we saw roughly 10 minutes of math occurring during a, during a, first grade, a, a, a typical first grade day where you would see 40 minutes of literacy instruction. Um, that begins to balance out by about fifth grade where we see about half and half, about a half hour of each occurring um, in fifth grade. The rule, though, is really, and I'm, I'm talking in terms of averages, but the rule is just nothing more than variation on top of variation on top of variation. So um, what we see um, is the entire range of codes on almost all, uh, on almost all uh, of the codes that we see. So for example, on a day in which we, uh, we were in a classroom um, uh, uh, with the instructions to the teacher that we want to see as much academics as could possibly be seen, we see plenty of classrooms lining up with zeros in terms of opportunities um, uh, in any number of those content areas, um, even literacy. Um, going into a, uh, a school in which we had multiple children in the same uh, grade, the same first grade, let's say we would be in six first grade classrooms in a, same, in a, in a single school, those first grade classrooms would be operating roughly uh, the same kind of curriculum across those three classrooms. We would go in and see stunningly different ways in which that curriculum was implemented from classroom to classroom to classroom, both in terms of time and the quality of implementation. Um, so the, the rule really is this notion of, of variation, uh, and that variation is consistent from pre-K all the way up to fifth. So we don't see, we don't see the fact that classrooms become sort of more uniform um, as, as kids age up. Um, and, and the other piece about, uh, from a measurement standpoint, is that when we used these kinds of metrics, so these time sampled metrics in which we were figuring out the percentage of, uh, you know, of time in which kids were engaged in whole group instruction or were offered math or were offered literacy, um, we see very little prediction from those, um, from those particular um, uh, measures to um, to gains in kids' outcomes that we would assess over the course of the year during using a standardized assessment um, such as the Woodcock-Johnson. So um, these kinds of metrics didn't seem to be purchasing us much in relation to prediction of outcomes. The only thing that we counted um, that actually predicted to achievement gains was the amount of math that the kid was exposed to. And I think that's quite frankly because any math is better than no math, and most of what we saw was very, very little math. Um, and so, so you, you, you began to see some purchase um, on math. The other way that we went into these classrooms was to rate the qualities of interactions between teachers and kids. And I'm going to focus mostly on this for the rest of the talk. Um, we developed this assessment called the Classroom Assessment Scoring System um, that we use across these uh, pre-K to fifth grade classrooms. Um, which was uh, largely derived from a more developmentally oriented analysis of settings and their impacts on kids um, in relation to uh, outcomes of, uh, of achievement, social competence, and things like engagement. Um, what we do, uh, the, if you were to look at, so for example, the developmental psychology literature on parenting, uh, you see lots of use of, of global rating scales of dimensions of interaction. And actually, even in the early childhood world, um, prior um, prior observational measures that have been used at some level of scale, like the Early Childhood Environment Rating Scale, also uh, does this kind of uh, more molar interaction uh, rating. So we, um, we developed a system where uh, uh, classrooms are rated on 10 dimensions of interactions across three different domains. Um, we, in some sense, think that this is kind of a theoretical claim about the organization of classrooms in which these latent uh, domains, emotional support, organization and management, and instructional support are really the ways in which classrooms uh, are organized, where interaction in classrooms is organized, and actually we find a fair amount of uh, evidence for the fact that when we look and factor this, uh, uh, these, this, um, these 10 uh, different dimensions at those different grades, we find these uh, pretty good evidence for this factor structure, this three domain uh, structure uh, working across all those grades. The way this plays out in a more um, 
uh, the way we train people and code things is really um, in, at, at, in, in depicted better, I think, in terms of this slide. So in, we see the domains here, these larger domains that organize interactions in classrooms at the top level, at the most molar level. And then um, at this level here, we're, these are actually the scores that are derived on the class. So these depict seven-point rating scales of dimensions of teacher-child interaction, positive climate, negative climate, teacher sensitivity, teacher's regard for kids' perspective, effective behavior management, productivity, which has to do with the management of time, and the degree to which the teacher uh, provides instructional learning formats that are likely to engage kids. Um, is it organized? Is it planful? Then in instructional support, we're really talking about the teacher's interactions with the kids as they stimulate concept development and higher order thinking, the kind of quality of feedback. Are there loops, um, feedback loops that actually occur um, as teachers engage with kids, or does teachers just say yes, no, and move on to the next kid? And then the extent to which the teacher, teachers model and engage in um, oral language behavior which, with kids that are likely to stimulate their, their conversation skills. Those dimensions are all then um, articulated and defined in terms of behavioral indicators that are then then anchored to actual descriptions of behaviors at a one, a three, a five, and a seven on the actual uh, scale points themselves. So when someone does a rating, they're looking at behaviors such as the indicators such as these that are that actually articulated at low and high levels. This is important because there's a there's a, a a high degree of specificity in the description of behaviors that becomes important later when we talk about professional development um, based on this tool. So that's kind of the, the overall organizational structure. When we go into measure quality, these are just smooth histograms across, the, um, across those um, 4,000 classrooms. Um, and again, we don't find a whole lot of differences across grades actually in these, in these dimensions. So you find that, you know, for the most part, classrooms are fairly positive social places to be. Um, kids are reasonably busy, although there, there's some variation. But then when you look at what teachers are doing to provide feedback to kids and is the feedback of the sort that would actually elicit a more complicated performance and offer the teacher the opportunity to then give even more feedback to the child tied to their performance, you see very, very low uh, ratings, on average a two. So what this means is that the modal, um, the modal type of feedback that a, that a, on performance that a child gets in a classroom is really about correct, incorrect, let me move to the next kid, correct, incorrect, let me move to the next kid, rather than kind of eliciting um, uh, performance and then commenting on, on performance. So, um, so this again you know, comes back to that notion of just basic description of the environment in classrooms. Um, doesn't tell us much at all about whether these dimensions actually predict the outcomes, which would be an important thing if we actually want to take this to the bank and then start um, saying that we're, we're measuring something that matters and we should start to try to improve it. Um, just again, descriptively, if we were, we were to take, rather than do it sort of the the, you know, the distributional properties that I just showed you. Here we, um, what we did was just subject the emotional and instructional uh, domains, those scales in those domains, to cluster, anal uh, cluster analysis uh, procedures. And, um, and moving through that, you see, roughly speaking, about 20% of classrooms, on average, having a score of a one or a two on both of, those, uh, both of those clusters, those domains. So that would be, you know, if we averaged the scales within those domains, they would be coming up that low, about 17% 7, of first grade classrooms looking like that. And then you see also the, the fairly low um, numbers in, uh, and, and averages, if you will, for high percentages of classrooms um, on these instructional dimensions overall. So these are, these are first grade classrooms. So, that, you know, essentially this is saying, you know, almost 20% of first grade classrooms are the kind of classrooms that we, we really would think would not have any impact, uh, presumably, on kids, on kids learning and be fairly negative places to be. Okay, but then the question really is, do these, do these elements, does variation in, in these observational elements, are they predicting to children's learning gains? So let me describe a couple of different studies that we've done to validate these um, uh, both uh, as they uh, are predicted by structural and selection factors and then predict learning gains. So I, as I said before, we see you know, this exceptional variability within and across grades. If we were just to take 
in the NICHD sample where we're watching kids, the same kids, first, third, and fifth grade, and divide the classroom quality, if you will, into tercials, you know, based on those distributions, top third, middle third, low third. Um, we would see that, you know, basically there's very, very little stability across grades for a given child. You know, so the likelihood that a child is going to be in a high quality classroom um, across those three years is fairly low, 15%. Um, it's also low for being in a low quality classroom. So there's a lot of churn is essentially what we see. You're likely to bounce around in the distribution quite a bit. We see almost no association between those ratings and um, the kind of structural features that often are the drivers for trying to change teachers uh, or, or we think might change kid outcomes. So teachers experience doesn't matter. The more experienced teachers um, are, are just as variable as the less experienced teachers are in these samples. Um, more training didn't seem to matter. Master's degree, more classes doesn't seem to translate to more uh, effectiveness in the classroom, as least as we're observing it here. And salary wasn't related. We do see some small associations. Again, these are just uh, you know correlations and adjusted regression coefficients, but they're not large. Um, so in class size, for example, we see that larger classes, and by this, this is coming out of a spline regression model, um, larger classes, which in this case are, uh, are more than 18 kids, are more structured uh, and more, somewhat more uh, rigid uh, in the observations that we make. So they're less positive, in some sense, uh, emotionally. And the kids in less than 15, not surprisingly, um, we saw, find more uh, higher scores on social dimensions and higher instructional quality. Family and in income and education again, are only modestly related to these, uh, to these schools. So we don't see really big effects on, again, only about 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 in terms of uh, variation in family income predicting the kind of quality that kids are getting as we observe quality. We, that, that was much lower than we expected. We expected to find much bigger um, income differences. Um, however, um, if you look at low achieving kids, and these are kids um, who are scored low on, uh, below a, uh, um, a standard deviation or lower on the Woodcock-Johnson before they get to school. So there, these are kids that we're seeing are likely to be low achievers once they get to school. Um, we find that those kids, only about 10% of them, are going to get access to stably high quality instruction once they get into school. So when you use not income but achievement for kids, um, we, see, um, we see that kind of, um, of selection. Okay, um, let's look now at sort of the prediction to outcomes then. Um, here we're looking at a number of studies. I'm going to just summarize quickly results from a number of studies where the designs that are used, are, you know, there's essentially a pretest um, that's given to the child at the beginning of the year. The observations are occurred, and there's a post-test at the end. All those pretests and post-tests are standardized tests. In this particular case, they're all the Woodcock-Johnson um, or the PPVT. Um, they are not. So, so we're looking not necessarily at individual growth because we don't have three points in time, but we're looking at mostly um, average averages here. Um, I'm looking for the thing. Okay. And that we're controlling for family and demographic factors, kids' prior performance and structural features of schooling as sort of covariate blocks. Uh, and then we're looking at um, the degree to which if you put into the sort of a standard regression framework these, um, these instructional and emotional quality elements of the classroom, um, are they predicting to more uh, positive achievement in social outcomes? And generally, we find small effects. Um, we find larger effects on more uh, proximal outcomes, so, such as child engagement. And as I said, we see some evidence that a little more instructional literacy early on, but typically math is the more consistent finding, um, predicts to those outcomes as well. Um, so we're seeing, again, these somewhat uh, smaller main effects, um, and then we see stronger effects as we look for interactions with various um, features of kids uh, coming in, or different groups of kids coming into school. So we see stronger effects for um, both emotional and instructional quality uh, that kids are exposed to for kids coming from low um, maternal education backgrounds, adjustment problems in kindergarten, and poor kids. And let me describe for a little bit um, what we, uh, a couple more detailed studies that go into a little, uh, uh, drill in a little bit more on these. So one of the questions that we've been uh, wrestling with in the pre-K world, this is a big question in policy, 
um, is uh, the degree to which different quality metrics translate into bigger outcomes for kids. So if you, if you track, um, for example, a the, the lot of the debates in the state pre-K um, world, as these programs are be being scaled up, um, it's very expensive to have in the program a uh, teacher with a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, and many of the programs are scaling up with teachers who have an associate's degree. And so the question is, should teachers have a, a, a master's degree or a bachelor's degree in order for us to ensure that those are high quality classrooms in which kids are going to learn? And there's a, there's a variety of these kind of questions that sit within this, you know, how should we focus attention? Um, most governors that are uh, trying to in, uh, convince their state legislators to invest in these programs are convincing them on the basis of, of the fact that they'll make sure these are high quality programs because these structural features are in place. The teachers will be qualified, there'll be a certain ratio of kids in the, in the classroom, the classroom will be running an effective curriculum, and the like. And so those structural features fall oftentimes, um, at, you know, within these kind of variables or can be uh, composited in an index that, um, that different organizations um, uh, tend to support. And in this particular case, we are going to actually test um, the combination of these structural features as they're composited in this index that's promoted by the National Institute of Early Education uh, Research, which is a nine-point index of is the teacher qualified and what's the group size and those kinds of things. These are the things that form the drivers for most po state policy. Um, we're going to compare that near index with observed interactions using the early childhood environment rating scale, which actually um, is a standardized observation of these settings, um, and the class, which is um, just looking at interactions. The Eckers actually looks at physical uh, aspects of the physical environment as well. We find there's, um, again, we're looking at gains in kids' uh, scores from um, the beginning of pre-K to the end. We find no association of these structural elements with any of these outcomes, either singly, so like teacher's education, or when we combine them together. So the near index, you know, if you have nine points on the near index, that's not showing any better return to kids' achievement gains than a three on the, on the near index. Um, what we do find is that instructional and emotional supports are predicting small effects, um, these, uh, these gains that actually uh, in, out, in achievement that do persist into kindergarten. So we find also some evidence that the gains made in pre-K, in pre-K classrooms that are higher, rated more highly on these uh, particular uh, dimensions, actually last into kindergarten. Another way of looking at this, um, I don't have the near index over here, but if the near index was over here as one of the, um, one of the inputs, there would no, be no checks. But you see here the consistency of effects, significant effects, um, on gains in these different outcomes here um, using the class elements. Okay, let's shift to first grade now. So we see some evidence in pre-K then of this notion that um, interactions matter uh, and that one can assess those interactions in a standardized fashion um, and, that can, uh, and, and can do that in a large number of classrooms. Here we're looking at gains um, in achievement. This is from the NICHD study of early child care study where we're adjusting um, uh, Woodcock-Johnson scores in the spring on the basis of prior Woodcock-Johnson scores. These are in the literacy area. And we're looking at um, 1,300 kids broken into um, two groups. One group where moms are classified as having higher levels of education, college and above, and one group in which moms are classified as having lower levels of education, uh, in this case, below college uh, and, and further on down. And we find here, just with that very crude cut, um, this is what happens. We go into classrooms and rate them low on instructional support, moderate and high. And these are tercially, these are determined using terciles on that distribution. So low is really pretty low. Um, and high is not really high um, on the seven point scale. Um, but we find that for kids coming from these two backgrounds, you see what happens here in terms of their gains in, uh, in uh, literacy scores over the course of the year where these kids uh, from the high education backgrounds are making gains despite being in a low uh, a, a classroom rated low, rated low on instructional support. And these kids are making much smaller gains, whereas both groups of kids in classrooms rated as high on instructional support are showing um, equivalent learning gains on this, uh, or at least differences fall to spring on average in these kinds of, uh, in these kinds of classrooms. 
Okay, let's look at the similar frame. We're still looking at literacy gains here, um, adjusted in the way I described. But here we're looking at kids who come out of kindergarten where their teachers rated them right at the end of the kindergarten year as having no adjustment problems or the teachers rated them as having multiple problems. That means they're kids who don't pay attention, um, having uh, difficulty learning, a variety of different um, kinds of problems reflecting um, adjustment in the classroom. These are what happens when they sort themselves into classrooms low, moderate, rated low, moderate, and high on emotional support. And you find here, again, the differences in learning uh, gains for kids in low and moderate um, supports and the fact that they're making equivalent kinds of gains in high supports. This is controlling for all the things we have in the NICHD study of early child care data set um, prior to these kids going to school, which is uh, all sorts of information about family process, family backgrounds. Uh, these are not obviously randomized. Kids aren't randomized into these, uh, into these um, conditions, but we're trying to control for as much of the uh, elements that would predict the kind of classroom that they go into and predict their, um, predict their learning at the start of school. Okay, um, so we see again some evidence perhaps that, uh, that um, interactions matter in these classrooms. Um, we're working a lot though on a bunch of measurement issues as well. I just want to describe this before we move into the next uh, phase of what, what we're doing. So um, we're seeing some evidence, I guess, from this is to, to suggest that uh, we can go in, we can measure at a fairly large scale observationally using standardized uh, metrics that are, um, that are predicting, at least in modest ways, to kids' learning gains. Um, and so part of what the work we're doing is try to refine some of the measurement um, challenges. Um, so we're developing an extension that works up into sixth grade and sort of informant versions to see whether they work. We're also working with Steve Roudenbush and Howard Bloom on this kind of eco-metrics approach. So we're trying to um, cross as many raters with as many days and as many cycles of rating as we can uh, to try to determine various uh, sources of variance and to begin to uh, understand the different ways in which rater and time of day, the different day, the season, uh, alternative units of analysis factor into um, the scores that we're getting. This has actually become very, very interesting for us uh, substantively um, because some of the things we're learning, for example, is that um, we're watching um, quality um, drop uh, significantly over the course of a day. So, so a kid's experience within a day you know, goes down over the course of the day. This is not surprising. Most of us have spent any time in elementary school. Um, the end of the day is not the most uh, fun time to be there. Um, but but we, we notice this happen. And then we also see, because many of these observations we have at different days across the year, and when you've got 4,000 classrooms, you've got a lot of classrooms on a lot of days across the year. And so one of the things we find is, a, you know, an incredible drop in the last month of the school year to the fact that even the best classrooms um, uh, about a month out start tailing off considerably. So when you think about policies and related to time and extending um, the school year and things like that, these become, I think, kind of, kind of interesting, um, um, these kind of uh, analyses. Um, and we're also finding pretty consistently that these global features as we assess them are more stable in the, in the fact of capturing between teacher differences that we can locate stably and reliably as between teacher effects and not as kind of um, uh, subject as much to the fluctuations of, of time of day. So if we were to conduct the G study um, analyses, the, the generalizability study analyses with the codes of discrete behaviors that we were time sampling before, we find incredible variation across the day that, that um, that is um, far more problematic and adds a lot more noise to the system. Um, so, so we're learning quite a bit from the measurement uh, standpoint about, uh, about things that might improve our capacity to do this work at a higher level of, of scale. Um, and then we're also doing a bunch of work in relation to uh, hypotheses about the importance of teachers' content knowledge. Okay. But given that, um, I think, uh, let me just summarize a little bit of what I think the implications are and then go on to what we're doing uh, currently. So we think, we, you know, there's some evidence here that we can observe at reasonable scale interactions that are predictive of student outcomes, recognizing the limitations of those predictions and the designs that they're, they're derived from. I think we have some purchase on the possibility of being able to define teachers' teacher quality in relation to teachers' performance in the classroom 
as opposed to just simply um, teachers' production of gains in test scores. Okay, so that's, that's an interesting policy uh, question there. It may have some implications. Um, we see that on average these interactions are of low quality, particularly on the instructional dimension, so there's a lot of implications for how we want to move that up. Remember how frequently instructional support popped up on that pre-K slide as predictive of achievement gain. So if it's that, you know, if it's that consistently um, related, if you want those classrooms that we're investing a lot of money in right now to be closing the achievement gap by the time kids go to school and the average quality in those classrooms is a two, you've got a lot of room to move on that dimension that seems to matter considerably for kids, um, for kids learning. Um, so the, the other thing that happens here is that um, we also now have the possibility of saying we can observe in a standardized way what it is that teachers are doing that seems to matter for kids' achievement. We can capture that visually. We can see it. Okay? If you can see it, then maybe you can train teachers to do it. <laughs> um, and so the, the idea is can that become the target for professional development for teachers, and can we build a set of systems that would actually produce that? And what, we, what I will describe to you is our efforts um, in a moment to do that. In a sense, what we've tried to do is map backward, is to say, if this is, teachers, if this is effective behavior for teachers in the classroom, then what would be the kind of supports that would need to be in place to be able to produce that? Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll describe that in a moment, which we've tested experimentally. So in a sense, what we're trying to do is approach these goals with uh, a very systematic and sort of scientifically um, validated uh, uh, approach to observation at the core, in a sense, trying to build a, a science of teaching and teacher training that relies on that. So just another way of looking at this, um, if you're in the policy world, you're interested in these things, I think, to some degree, or in the teacher education world, too. Um, as they might relate to these things, um, the, uh, I think we can start thinking about filling in the black box um, that we have uh, struggled to fill in um, to some degree over, over the last several years, and uh, that we can begin to look at the extent to which um, um, what happens in the classroom might be a, a mediator of some of those, um, some of those uh, inputs, and we'll describe for a moment what we're doing in relation to professional development in that regard. We've developed over the course of the last five years an approach to, to, to promoting more effective interactions between teachers and kids that we call My Teaching Partner. And uh, our focus on My Teaching Partner has been entirely around how do you improve interactions between teachers and kids in the classroom. So we, we've tried to not get too stuck in the issue of whether um, the teachers need to have a curriculum. There's no question in the, that, that there has to be some sort of curriculum in the classroom. Um, but what we've tried to do is to say that teacher-child interactions are really the medium in which curricula are implemented and the bane of every person who tries to evaluate a, uh, a curriculum because you end up with all this variation. So the point is, can we actually focus on that variation as the thing that we want to change and, and be, uh, be improved? Um, we use the class as the means for defining this um, and as a target of professional development. And so these are some of the things that, when I talk about backward mapping, these are some of the skills that we think we could build professional development to be able to do that might actually translate into higher scores on the class for teachers. So if we could increase teachers' observation skills by identifying interactive behaviors and cues using the class as a lens. So if I talk about it's important for teachers to be sensitive in their interaction, and I want to improve teachers' ability to do that, I need to train them in being able to see that and define that in their practice and in others' practice. So identifying that would be important. Um, we also work hard on, on helping teachers identify how kids respond differentially to teacher behavior. So again, creating this notion that the kid's behavior is interdependent upon your behavior and that there's a loop here that you need to pay attention to. An opportunity to learn is created in that looping that goes back and forth. Um, and that um, we also try to increase teachers' skills, in a sense, to identify alternative responses to kids' cues. I'm going to describe results from a, a project in which uh, 240 uh, teachers uh, across the state of Virginia were randomized into three different conditions. Um, at the base level, um, a group of teachers only got a set of materials, which are essentially lesson plans in literacy and language development. 
Then teachers got that, plus access to a website that I'll show in a moment that had video clips using the class to define high quality practice. And then teachers got what we call a consultancy, which is a coaching model that was laid on top of the website access and the curriculum. Um, so in the website um, intervention, teachers would be able to go to the My Teaching Partner video library and um, let's say they were interested, this is completely on their own, they were interested in working on uh, their, uh, how they could improve their behavior management. And they might click on that behavior management tab and get access to about 20 different video clips that had um, examples of, this was for teacher sensitivity, that would have about a two minute clip of a teacher who we coded as a six or a seven on teacher sensitivity and we pulled out of that clip a, an example at the indicator level. Remember I talked about those indicators in the class system, there's domains and then scales and then indicators. We pulled out indicator level um, um, clips and described in very specific language what it was the teacher was doing that was the reason why we rated it as a, a six or a seven on sensitivity. So it's very specific language about the teacher's behavior. That's the website intervention. So teachers get to go to it if they're assigned to that condition. The, the consultation intervention involves the teacher uh, videoing herself, sending us the video of her instruction. And remember, we're only focusing on language and literacy here, as, uh, so she's, she's sending us a lesson that she's videotaped herself delivering in language development or literacy. Um, the consultant reviews and edits that video clip in a very standardized fashion. Um, that tries to, again, pull out from the teacher's example, uh, the teacher's video, three um, clips that show the teacher demonstrating effective teaching using one of the dimensions, not demonstrating effective teaching, and then focusing very clearly on her instruction. So it's a very standardized way of editing these clips. Those uh, clips are um, pulled out, edited, and annotated, much in the same way you just saw before. Um, and the teachers asked a question to respond to. Those, that um, set of materials is posted on the teacher's private website. Teacher goes to the website anytime she can within this two week cycle. She looks at it, she writes back, and then the teacher and consultant meet over the phone. All of this is done on the net. The, none of these consultants traveled to go to any of these teachers' places, uh, classrooms all across the state of Virginia, and we were we had several classrooms that were hundreds of miles away. So this is all mediated through the internet. So again, one of the things we're trying to do is see, um, can, you, can you develop something and actually push it to a point where it might be scalable? And we thought the net might be a way to, to do that. This would be part of what the teacher would see if she logged onto her private website. So here, this is the first prompt. It's called nice work. So this teacher is working on teacher sensitivity. Her consultant writes, when teachers anticipate and respond to students' academic, emotional, and social needs, they demonstrate sensitivity. What you see yourself doing in this clip that reflects your understanding of the difficulty the students may have in writing their personal narratives. So this is, that's the lesson, that's the prompt. The teacher writes here, and the, and the, the, um, the um, consultant has also um, inserted a, a, uh, um, a link, a hot link, that'll take the teacher to the video library and show her examples of sensitivity. This consultancy cycle repeats itself every two weeks over the course of the year. So let me um, describe to you some of the results from this, uh, from this intervention study then. What we find um, is that when we examine effects, now we're just going to look at effects on whether these forms of professional development changed teacher-child interaction, okay? And then we'll look at effects on kids' outcomes. Um, we've looked at this in a couple different ways. We've done um, uh, effects of condition on outcomes, so web versus consultation. We've looked at treatment on the treated, uh, and we've looked at some moderation in regard to uh, whether these supports are more or less important on the basis of different classroom demands. We find that teachers who receive consultation are showing um, significantly greater increases over the course of the year in the quality of their instructional interactions. I'll show you these graphs in a moment. We see early career teachers who only have access to the website. So if you're randomized into the website and you're an early career teacher, we find that those um, uh, resources matter for you. They show gains in interactions with kids. 
and as we've begun to try to unpack this, so we have all this way of coding what the teacher's doing while she's on the web. Is she looking at herself? Is she looking at other teachers? And we see that looking, the time you spend on the website looking at yourself, filling out those consultancy prompts are really seem to be an engine, uh, if you will, of change um, that, that we're observing. And we find the consultation moderates the poverty, uh, poverty effect that I'll show you in a moment. So these are just graphs that show changes in sensitivity for teachers in the consul consultation condition and web-only conditions over the course of the year. Those are just months across the bottom. We've got about a one-point gain in sensitivity. I didn't go through this before, but actually we've done threshold analyses of some of those validity coefficients to kid outcomes, and a one-point gain on class dimensions um, does, uh, at least in the non-experimental study, and we'll see it here in a moment, does seem to be um, um, uh, enough to push kid outcomes up a bit um, significantly. Is this relative to the control condition? This is, this is relative to, this is consultation versus just the web. One of the challenges we had, uh, problem with, quite frankly that we had was um, we had these teachers sending us in videotapes and the teachers in the materials group we have, we just didn't have them, we didn't have, we ran out of money basically, um, and we didn't have enough uh, funds to have them be, the, so we didn't really have a true control condition here. Um, both of these teachers got, uh, groups of teachers got some resources. Um, so this is just two different levels of support randomly, teachers assigned randomly into both of them. Um, okay, so um, let me just point out that, that this one here we see for, um, we see for sensitivity, we see for language modeling, and we see for um, teacher's behavior management. So we're seeing these effects consistently across different dimensions. This is the effect on, uh, on, on poverty. So what we did was take under the hypothesis essentially that teachers would need more support if they were teaching in more demanding circumstances and, and con we uh, computed estimates of these effects for teachers who would be teaching in 100, with 100 percent of the classroom poor or 50 percent of the classroom poor because we had variation in, in poverty in those classrooms. And so we're looking here at the degree to which um, the, uh, the, the teachers in the consultation condition differ in the web in, in relation to, um, to the poverty effects uh, in the classroom. And here we see that both the consultation conditions are still showing this kind of gain. Um, these are not different from one another according to the different poverty levels. But here you see what happens in the web-only condition. So the, all you're getting is access to the website and you're teaching in a, in, in a classroom in which all the kids are, are poor. You see essentially a decline across the year. That's actually a significant slope. And you see the big gap if you're teaching in a 100% poor classroom, if you got the consultation condition or you didn't get the consultation condition. So you see some evidence, again, this is not, we're not randomly assigning kids to, to these kind of uh, circumstances or teachers, so this is really, um, but adjusting for a variety of things going in, we're seeing some evidence that in high demand classrooms, the more support you get seems to matter even more um, than it would uh, otherwise. Okay. When we look at uh, effects of this kind of support on kid outcomes, here we are looking at all three groups, so the consultation group, the web group, and the um, activities only group. We find again that when teachers participate in the consultation, kids are showing greater gains. Tests of early literacy. We also see that teachers who use those activities and lesson plans more um, are also producing somewhat um, greater outcomes. Uh, as well. This is just an SEM uh, framework in which we're looking at um, the pre-test essentially in literacy, predicting the post-test, and then we're looking at the degree to which um, these groups contrasts are significantly different, and we find that the consultation condition uh, is significantly different than the um, uh, improved over the uh, materials condition. Small effects, very, very stable uh, assessments over the course of the year. This is a treatment on the treated uh, analysis where we're looking at these outcomes across the top, gains in these outcomes across the top over the course of the year. Um, this is an HLM framework, so these are the kid characteristics here. Um, intervention um, uh, usage, really, components is at the uh, level two. And here we're seeing um, effects, positive effects on, on a couple of different outcomes for um, the degree to which teachers were engaged in um, 
the consultation more than 20 hours um, and uh, in contrast to zero hours and more than 20 hours uh, and less than 20 hours. And we see uh, here's the effects for um, greater use of the language and literacy activities. So there's some evidence here of both um, use of a curriculum matters, okay, and um, getting coached and having some professional development support also matters um, for these kinds of, of outcomes that we're looking at. Um, and then this is just comes out of that analysis where we looked at whether there were interactions with teachers' experience, and we find here that um, for teachers grouped according to two, eight, and 14 years of experience, the teachers who received more or participated in more hours of the consultation um, had a greater impact for um, uh, the teachers with less experience. Again, something we, we might expect um, given their um, uh, possible need for um, coaching. Okay, so that gets us through kind of a, an in-service kind of uh, tests of, these, uh, of, uh, of a set of supports, the consultation condition and the website condition. We finished that uh, study and we thought, um, we wish we knew a few things going into that study and we wish we did uh, certain things differently and we wondered whether we could build a, a course that could be delivered in a college context that would produce changes in teachers' capacity to read cues, to know the class, to identify elements of uh, effective interaction in their and other teachers' behaviors in video, in language and literacy context. So what we set about to do um, in, this, in this study was to uh, conduct a, a randomized control trial of two, the effects of two different um, uh, two different interventions. One was this course that we developed, and one is the consultation. And teachers get this um, uh, in, uh, in, in a two-stage randomized trial where they're randomized into the course or no course, and then they're subsequently randomized into consultation or no consultation. So th this trial is actually being conducted right now. Um, we've done an initial wave of, of uh, course um, uh, implementation and we are seeing some evidence we haven't you know analyzed this uh, completely and it's not a complete uh, sample yet um, but we're seeing changes in knowledge as we would expect it to so the activities that we're running teachers through uh, are changing them on some of the assessments uh, of knowledge and uh, and sort of cue detection that we would uh, have hoped to so um, to conclude and then we can have some questions so I think um, you know up to this point um, we're, um, we're seeing some evidence that these, this uh, approach to standardized observations of interactions in classrooms that teachers engage in um, may be feasible, um, reliable, and valid with respect to uh, predicting children's learning gains. It may be a scalable language and or lens for, um, for classroom settings. Um, we see the uh, pretty good uh, evidence that these three domains, I didn't go into this study in a long, a long detail, but when we, um, when we do the, the kind of work that would confirm this factor structure at each different grade level, we find uh, good evidence of consistency and fit. Um, so maybe, maybe it is the case that good teaching is good teaching is good teaching, um, whether you're teaching in a pre-K or whether you're teaching in a fifth grade, and that these dimensions of interaction that we're describing are applicable across those different grade levels, even though the behavioral indicators might change a little bit according to um, appropriate developmental uh, uh, definitions. Um, we think that there's some uh, evidence as well that this could be used, these observations could be used in a sense as a lever uh, for research on teacher professional development and preparation that might actually lead to increasing quality of what we observe out there in increasing kids' outcomes. Remember I said at the beginning, I think this is just an illustration of what we're, um, I think what we're um, trying to do uh, as we tackle, um, uh, as we try to tackle this problem. Um, it clearly, I think, uh, as if indeed things continue to play out as they have played out up to this point and we continue to subject this, um, these approaches to uh, the kind of rigor ana rigorous analysis we'd want to as it scales up into larger systems, um, we could see that these, um, these tools might have implications for accountability systems, for definitions of teacher quality, and for research on teacher education. So we might even envision that these observations might become the target outcome for what a teacher education program would define as effective teaching. So you might even envision a system in which 
if you believe, you know, if you believe the evidence, that you might not license a teacher until they were above a certain level, or you might uh, use these observations in a teacher preparation program during the teacher's student teaching uh, experience and, and say you have to get above a certain point uh, or we won't pass you on to the next level of licensure. I mean, you could imagine some of these kind of uses of it. Um, other people have imagined that you would use these kind of metrics to also assign teachers to certain professional development experiences and incent their participation in those. Um, in the early childhood world, this uh, idea of uh, what we call quality rating and improvement systems is really um, uh, beginning to take these kind of metrics and put them into uh, systems in which um, pro classrooms are regularly monitored um, and assigned a certain level of stars for certain levels of, of, um, uh, of quality that they evince in those observations and that those stars then become publicized in certain ways so that people could purchase childcare with so many stars and not so many stars and, um, and the like. So I think there's a lot of research to be done there to know whether that's the right way to go. Um, but I think uh, the implications are that we could at least do this as much with observations of, of um, what teachers do with kids in classrooms as we do with standardized tests as the, as the metric for whether a, a classroom is an effective place. Um, so we're seeing this uh, currently used in a number of di different teacher quality frameworks. So, so this is going to, the class is going to be used as part of the Head Start monitoring system um, nationally. Um, uh, this gives me shivers. Um, sometimes in terms of uh, how this is all going all to work. Um, we see, as I just mentioned before, that Minnesota, Connecticut, and Georgia, some others, are using this as part of their QRIS, uh, Quality Rating and Improvement Systems. Um, we and some other um, uh, teacher preparation programs are starting to use these tools within the context of teacher prep. And again, you can begin to see whether if you can anchor, you know, um, a performance metric around some standardized uh, measure and it's observationally based, um, you can begin to build and test experimentally whether certain preparation experiences are producing that outcome. And that's essentially the, the notion there. Um, and there have been some city school systems that have approached us. We haven't done this work yet um, that are considering these kinds of um, metrics in, in relation to tenure decisions and merit pay. So, um, this is what's happening essentially as we have seen this kind of filter up into the, uh, into the policy framework. So um, that's the conclusion of my talk, but I'm glad to uh, answer any questions for the time that we have uh, remaining. So, yes? Um, I'm not really familiar with policy research, and so I may not be asking this, um, I may be asking this from the wrong perspective, but this sounds a lot to me like the um, kinds of interaction analysis and micro-teaching approaches that teacher education used in the 1970s and left behind in favor of more constructivist or social constructivist ideas about learning. And so I'm trying to, can you help me understand how this approach is different than that in its attention to behavior? Um, and then also how we can avoid um, seeing tools like this used to really selectively guide teacher training in the same way that um, we see teachers teaching to the tests that are used for the No Child Left Behind accountability systems. Okay, so let me uh, answer the latter question before I get to the former one. I would say that if there was strong evidence that what was being observed by this or any other tool, so there are other observational tools around, um, was, there was strong evi and convincing evidence that those um, measures were related to children's achievement, I would want teacher preparation programs to be training the teachers to that test. <laughs> because that would be a better indicator, the best indicator I can think of and the most defensible one for what a teacher's behavior is that's producing achievement. So I, don't, I, I would rather have that be the case um, than, than a case in which everybody does whatever they think is right. Um, and everybody has, I think that's the problem we have, quite frankly, in teacher education. I think that's probably why we don't see any evidence that teacher education matters a whole lot you know, when you grind it around in large scale studies. Um, so, um, the former question, um, so, so some of the theoretical basis, how is this different? Well, um, first off, uh, it's, it's, I think it's different from some of the constructivistic approaches in, tens, in the tendency to try to quantify um, certain dimensions of interactions. And uh, in some sense, it borrows a lot from that approach. It borrows from both, in some sense. It borrows from the constructivistic um, framework that tends, a, that, that, that tends to pay attention to 
um, opportunity as it's created between the two of us as we interact with one another and a more molar kind of approach to that, um, that children's learning emerges out of that. On the other hand, it says very clearly that teachers have a very direct role and intentional role to play in learning. Um, and then it borrows, I think, somewhat from the micro in the sense of saying you've got to define something. If you want teachers to actually begin to do something, you've got to define it at a level of specificity so you can see it and agree upon um, seeing it. So I think it trades between both of those spaces, um, but it's different than both. Um, other questions? Yeah. Um, one of the slides showed that the teacher sensitivity decreased over the course of the year with yeah. the web only. Is that implying then that it's actually worse for the teachers to have just access to the web than have no access at all? I don't know. Uh, I mean, that, that was in the high poverty classrooms. So that was, that was um, in the 100% poverty classrooms. That is a significant negative slope. I think what that's saying is that um, if you don't give teachers much of a resource, that the demands of the kids are going to overwhelm that teacher's capacity to teach effectively in that classroom. So I, I, that's my hypothesis. But it could just be that. Um, the web had a negative effect, but we don't see that anywhere else. Um, the slide before that, though, there's two slides that actually showed that, too, and the one didn't. Right. On average, that was flat. Um, so it, basically what you saw before was those two groups combined, and, and what you see is a, a flat, um, a flat uh, slope for, uh, for the web group. Could I ask a quick question related to that? Sure. So the classrooms that teachers were seeing on the web, were those likely to be classrooms similar to their own? Yeah. Uh, so would they be uh, classrooms with 100% high poverty students, for example? Most of those classrooms were classrooms with the mixtures, mixtures of kids, um, but, but mostly drawn from uh, classrooms where there were a reasonable number of poor kids in those classrooms. So these were, these were sort of teachers teaching in state-funded pre-K at-risk kind of programs. Yes? So the feedback, did you try to measure or try to, uh, in some way, determine the level of rigor in the feedback that the teachers were getting from their coaches? Oh, yeah, good point. So we had six different coaches that were um, interacting with these, with these teachers. And um, all of those prompts that are written are stored. So the, you know, the great thing about doing this on the net is you have all this <laughs> you have all of this information as data. It's already stored. And so we had a, a weekly check on all of those prompts um, to see that they conformed to what it was that we wanted those prompts to be, which was uh, pulling out uh, a, an explicit example of the teacher's behavior according to the dimension that the teacher and the consultant were working on. So we worked very hard on that um, over the course of the year. And we, um, to the degree that that varied, um, and it did vary. Um, we captured that as much as we could in implementation, and all of those, um, all of those effects are adjusted for the consultant. Um, so we we adjust out any consultant effects, and we do see some consultant effects. You know, some consultants are better than other consultants. Yes. Second, which is somewhat unrelated, was that with regard to the consultancy intervention, uh, its positive effects were not altogether surprising, although the, they were pretty dramatic. But uh, they seem like they might be very resource uh, intensive. intensive. Yeah. So the question of scalability. Yeah. Comes into play. Okay. Good. Well, so on the content dimension. Um, we, so if you remember back to the context in which these measures were developed, and this was sort of by accident and by intent, we needed to go into all these classrooms all across the country, and we knew that the teachers were going to tell us that they were teaching reading or they were tell us, tell us that they were teaching math, and we weren't going to see, we were going to see something else. And we also wanted to track kids across the day. So we, we, we designed them by intent 
to be content neutral. Um, so to be applicable across whatever content area the teacher was teaching. Um, and theoretically speaking, what we're trying to do is, is capture aspects of co-regulation, if you will, between teacher and the, and the child that we believe from various you know, uh, hypotheses are important properties of, of um, behavioral interaction that promote learning and engagement across content areas. The interesting questions, and I don't know the answers to these yet, because I really these are studies we'd want we very much want to do, is do teachers with and we and, and honestly we don't see any variation when we when we contrast um, the teaching of math with the teaching of literacy with the teaching of history, on average in those kind of uh, uh, dimensions that we observe. The interesting question would be. I think if you took somebody and you trained them up very well, let's say, in teaching a particular content area at a, at, at a real level of depth, would you see some differences in what we're seeing there? Um, and, and those are studies we'd be really interested in doing. On the, I think you probably would see differences. I, I think you would see teachers more able to elaborate conceptually, for example, if they knew more about the content they were teaching uh, than, than, than we're seeing. Um, the, um, the question about scalability, we calculated the costs of all of these um, interventions that we, you know, the cost of the consultation condition. So I have one, consult, one consultant, full-time person per 20 teachers. Um, we, uh, when you cost that out, you're, you're basically spending, roughly speaking, about $2,000 a teacher over the course of the year to produce those gains. Now, if you count up the, and that's completely everything. Um, if you count up, if Alan Auden, you know, if you look at his work on what teacher professional development costs on the K-12 side, um, that's very much on the low end of what the, what the average teacher gets um, uh, for professional development, adding across all, the, that, that ranges usually from about um, $1,700 up to about $7,500 in the studies that he's at, per teacher. So we're on the low end of the scale with something that, you know, we're, demonstrating some effectiveness with. So, um, you know, it's, a, you know, it's, an, it's an interesting um, point. Um, okay, uh, let me go back here. Yes. So, a, a classic example of um, a teacher behavior that was found to have positive effects on student outcomes is wait time. That if a teacher uses wait time, then it, has, it can have positive effects. But when that gets translated into um, what, what do you teach a teacher to do related to wait time, you run into trouble because what makes it a productive practice is knowing when to use it and why. And so my question is, how did you translate these um, relate to the, the behaviors that you, you saw you found to be connected to student right. outcomes? How did you translate that into the, the course and the consulting? So because the, there has to be an underlying, there's, there's an underlying reason for why and how that connection occurs. And also in relation, one more piece, sorry. In relation to how do you teach that to a teacher? So there has to be some sort of underlying theory for how to learn to teach it. Okay, so why wait time works sometimes and not other times or why um, any number of things, you know, a discrete behavior works sometimes and not other times, uh, is that um, where the action is, is in the contingencies, okay? It's in the degree to which that wait time is an appropriate response in that circumstance and enables the kids to keep, stay engaged. So that's why we define everything in terms of the behavioral response to kids' cues and does the kid's uh, response to the teacher's response indicate uh, a, a greater or, or a consistent degree of engagement. So um, we, we, that's why we don't look at very discrete behaviors. We're making ratings on dimensions of interaction that reflect those contingencies. So the, conting the notion of contingency is built into the very definitions of what it is that we're rating and measuring and what it is that teachers are trained to do. So teachers are trained to look at how did that teacher re respond to? What was, what was the effect of that behavior in response to that cue? Um, 
sensitivity is defined fundamentally in that, in that kind of, uh, uh, of case. Um, quality of feedback is fundamentally about, about feedback. So, um, so this notion of contingencies and that, um, and that your behavior, in a sense, has meaning, if you will, or value, uh, or opportunity for kids only insofar as it, as it is an appropriate response to that um, particular situation in relation to this larger dimension of interaction that we're paying attention to. So, and, and you, can, you, can isolate, you can isolate very clear examples of those contingencies in videotape. You could show them to teachers and you can see how you don't respond and what the kid does and how when you do respond, what the kid does and if you miss the target, what the kid does. Um, and and it's, it's, that's what you train teachers to do. That's the skill we're trying to develop in them. Over here, yes. that seem to you to be culturally relevant or neutral, so that the way that teacher sensitivity is both conveyed by a teacher and received by a child would apply across cultural groupings, ethnic... Um, so I think, you know, since it's, all, all of these scales are, you know, you have to pay attention to whether, you know, um, whether there would be any differences. We took the, um, we took the stance uh, ahead of time that if you define sensitivity in terms of timely responsiveness to a child's cues that conveys comfort, support, uh, and respect, then, then you're watching the child's response. So the te a teacher can't get coded as sensitive if she displays something that's culturally insensitive. Okay? If the child were to react negatively to a behavior, no matter how positive that behavior might look to you and me and feel to the teacher, it's not sensitive if the, if the child rejects that behavior somehow or it leads to a, a, a level of disengagement. So, um, so what we're looking for are broader, more molar properties of interaction that reflect this notion of co-regulation um, that, that um, we felt at the beginning there was reason to believe you could um, describe in ways that were culturally neutral. Now, we, what we found is that when we look at um, ethnicity of the kids, income background of kids, um, language uh, background of kids, and similar information that we have in relation to teachers, that we, we simply don't see any evidence of interactions, uh, statistically speaking, um, between those features and kids' learning gains. Okay, so that the scales operate the same for all of those different groups. And, you know, again, I think the other thing is that there's, 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 there is as much heterogeneity within those groups, you know, as there is between those groups. We, I think, quite frankly, we focus far too much on the potential for differences when we can probably get a lot of purchase in improving outcomes for kids if we didn't spend as much time um, focusing on those differences. But at the same time, recognize that teachers do need to be responsive in ways um, that do reflect their attention to, to differences and where the kids may be coming from. We do f actually find big interactions. Um, kids who come in who are, um, it's sort of the, the, the one about the kindergarten adjustment problems, but we've um, done some prior work on kids' temperament and coding kids' temperament. And kids, that are, um, kids that are very bold and boisterous um, are very likely to be um, rated as extraordinarily inattentive <laughs> Um, by their teacher and observed to be very inattentive by uh, independent observers in classrooms where teachers have low levels of sensitivity. When teachers have high levels of sensitivity, those kids look just like the most shy kids who pay um, an extraordinary amount of attention to the teacher in the classroom. So there's, there are some characteristics of kids that do matter in relation to um, teachers' interactions, but they have, it has more to do with other um, I think more salient features of what what the child's bringing to the um, to the interaction. Brian, in uh, an earlier conversation, you mentioned be some work you're doing looking at the similar uh, professional development in middle and high school. Yeah, I just, I'd like just to say a minute or two about that. And okay, what that is. so this this study that I just described about the coaching in pre-K, we're basically replicating that in middle and high schools with early career teachers. Um, it's been really interesting to do that. Uh, so we find that teachers, uh, quite honestly, 
have been a little more compliant with the intervention because uh, I think they're a little bit more used to the tech um, dimensions of it. They're more used to going to the web and doing the kinds of things that they have to do on the web. We're seeing, um, we're seeing early indications from that study that the, the, for kids whose teachers are assigned to the consultation condition, um, those kids are at least reporting those teachers to be um, more engaging, uh, more supportive of the kids. Um, the kids are, are describing higher levels of motivation to work for that teacher. So, that, I mean, that was part of what we, we hypothesized. We haven't yet done the achievement. Um, and we're going to, in, in that study, we're going to be using the state standards tests rather than, uh, you know, I mean, here we're using, um, you know, we're using sort of omnibus achievement tests that aren't even tied to the standards that the teachers are teaching and seeing some effects. So I think we may see bigger effects on achievement, but I don't know. Okay, one more. Uh, go ahead. How do you measure engagement? Engagement on the part of the kid. On the part of the kid. Yeah, this is very hard to do uh, observationally. So um, essentially what we're doing is... Uh, uh, it's easier to do on those video clips because you can actually pay attention to, a, you can isolate a, a, a kid and you can draw attention to it that way. Um, but we would, we include in the package of ratings a rating of average student engagement in the class, in the classroom on average. Um, that, um, that's one of the, the, the elements that we use. But then when we're looking at a more proximal level at individual kids to try to determine classroom effects on individual kids, we're doing the best we can to, to capture um, active forms of engagement like body posture showing the kid is leaning toward the teacher, that, that kind of participation um, uh, effort that, that you'll see uh, reflected in kids' uh, movement, um, uh, orientation of their head toward things. W w one of the things we're, I'm very interested in doing, I was talking to somebody about this earlier, is um, I think Jackie Eccles and I were talking about this. Well, Brian, uh, uh, Kevin in, is doing this work as well, um, which is to try to um, uh, capture at a much more refined level um, some perhaps psychophysiological proxies of engagement, so heart rate, eye gaze, things like that that we might be able to capture to see if we can do some mining of data around that. So we're trying to develop better measures of engagement. Thank you all very much. This was a lot of fun.